All right, we will do posterior arm and forearm, which corresponds to Grant's 15th edition, pages 38 through 39, and 53 through 55. Let's start with some of the bony structures before we move on to the more challenging part of the musculature of the posterior arm and forearm. So here we have the distal part of the humerus, which is going to be very important as we discuss mainly the muscles of the posterior forearm. On the medial aspect, here is the medial epicondyle, and on the lateral aspect, we have the lateral epicondyle. If we flip around to the posterior side, we can see that the medial epicondyle is very prominent, and then the lateral epicondyle is less prominent compared to the medial. The posterior side has a very large cavity here, and this fossa is the olecranon. If we temporarily hide the ulna, we can see that the trochlea is this structure here, Flip back around to the anterior side, the trochlea articulates with the ulna and the capitulum serves as a pivot point for the head of the radius here. Most of the bony structures are rather straightforward and easy to identify, and we mentioned them in the anterior form video, so let's move on to the more challenging aspect of this lab, the musculature. The most superficial muscle of the posterior arm is a tri-headed or three-headed muscle, the triceps brachii. So the triceps has three heads. The lateral head, which is obviously most lateral on the arm, the medial head, which is obviously most medial, and then the long head, which is the longest head. You can see it's extending all the way up here. So directly deep to the triceps brachii is the radial nerve, which can be seen running here in the radial groove with its accompanying artery, the arteria profunda brachii, or the deep artery of the arm. Note how the radial nerve is also going to give off a cutaneous branch that innervates the skin on top of the triceps the posterior cutaneous nerve of the arm. This should be easy for you to remember. If the radial nerve innervates the triceps muscle, then it should probably also send a cutaneous branch to innervate the skin sitting directly on top of it. It will also give off another branch as it's traveling on the humerus, the posterior cutaneous nerve of the forearm. So now as we move more distally on top of the extensor carpi radialis longus is the posterior cutaneous nerve of the forearm, which is the cutaneous branch of the radial nerve that innervates a strip of skin on the posterior aspect of the forearm. This should be no surprise because the radial nerve is also going to send innervation to the muscular component of the posterior forearm. We begin on the posterior aspect of the elbow here with a muscle called the enconium. The enconius actually means elbow in Greek. It's rather obvious why they named it that way We're on the posterior aspect of the elbow. It is sometimes considered to be a continuation of the triceps brachii muscle because it supports the triceps in fully extending the elbow and keeping it in that position. It has a proximal attachment on the distal part of the lateral epicondyle of the humerus and attaches to the lateral aspect of the olecranon of the ulna. Again, it assists the triceps in keeping the elbow extended. The other muscles of the posterior compartment of the forearm can be thought of as a group of extensors with a common origin on the lateral epicondyle of the humerus, with some exceptions, of course and a common innervation by the radial nerve, either directly or by a branch, mainly the superficial branch of the radial nerve, the deep branch of the radial nerve, or a continuation of the deep branch called the posterior interosseous nerve. The enconius, the brachioradialis, and the extensor carpi radialis longus are the three muscles that you need to remember, which are directly innervated by the radial nerve. So let's again think about some of the themes, one of them being compartmentalization. All of the muscles of the anterior compartment of the forearm are flexors and originate on the medial epicondyle. All of the muscles of the posterior compartment of the forearm are extensors and originate on some part of the lateral epicondyle of the humerus. Of course, with some exceptions, such as the deep muscle group of the posterior forearm. So the muscles of the posterior forearm are separated into a superficial, intermediate, and deep group. In the superficial group, all of the muscles have some sort of origin at the lateral epicondyle of the humerus. So we'll go from the ulnar aspect of the arm to the more radial aspect of the arm, starting with the muscle here in blue, the brachioradialis. This is a very unique muscle because it can act as a flexor, a supinator, and pronator depending on the position of the forearm. The terminal sensory branch of the muscular cutaneous nerve is actually running directly on top of the brachioradialis. Here's the lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm that runs directly on the belly of the muscle. Underneath the brachioradialis, we can see that the terminal 
superficial branch of the radial nerve will travel down to the wrist to provide sensory innervation to the dorsum or the back of the hand, wrist, thumb, and the radial aspect of the first two fingers, the index finger and the middle finger, and even potentially sometimes half of the ring finger. Also directly deep to the brachial radialis, we can see that the radial recurrent artery is sitting medial to the radial nerve. Now, directly next to the brachial radialis is the extensor carpi radialis longus muscle. Directly on top of the extensor carpi radialis longus muscle is the posterior cutaneous nerve of the forearm that was derived from the radial nerve. Here, you can see it is coursing on top of it before it transitions, and then it starts running on top of the muscle that accompanies the longus, which is the brevis. Now remember that if there is a longus muscle, and you better be looking for a brevis muscle somewhere nearby. Unlike the extensor carpi radialis longus muscle, the brevis is not innervated directly by the radial nerve, but, but rather is the posterior interosseous nerve. Now, if we continue to move in the same direction, the next muscle is the extensor digitorum. As we follow the extensor digitorum down the posterior aspect of the forearm, we can see that it passes under the extensor retinaculum. The extensor digitorum is capable of extending all of the joints that it crosses over. That it means that it can extend the metacarpal phalangeal joints, the distal inner phalangeal joints, and the proximal inner phalangeal joints. Note how there is not an extensor digitorum superficialis or extensor digitorum profundus like we see on the flexor aspect of the arm. As we continue to move more in the same direction, the next muscle is the extensor digiti minimi, which extends the most minimal digit, or the small digit, the pinky finger, hence the name extensor digiti minimi. The extensor digitorum and the digiti minimi compose the intermediate muscle group. Next up is the last muscle of the superficial group, the extensor carpi ulnaris muscle. It is really close to the, its antagonist of the anterior flexor compartment, the flexor carpi ulnaris. Here is the flexor carpi ulnaris of the anterior compartment of the forearm. Now quickly, let's notice something that's important. Notice how the extensor carpi radialis brevis, not the longest here, but just the brevis, the extensor digitorum, the extensor digiti minimi, and the extensor carpi ulnaris all have a common tendinous origin here at the lateral epicondyle. This is the common extensor tendon. This is also a great way to remember that the same nerve the posterior interosseous nerve innervates all of these muscles. They share a common origin at the common extensor tendon. They're all going to be innervated by the same nerve, which is the posterior interosseous nerve. The deep muscles are called the deep muscles because they're deep in form, and they're also innervated by the deep branch of the radial nerve. Now, this is a very high yield image here. It travels through the supinator muscle. The supinator muscle telling you exactly what it does. It supinates the forearm. And that makes a lot of sense because its action is to oppose the pronator teres. Moving from the radial side to the ulnar side, the first one that we see is the abductor pollicis longus. If you follow the tendon of the abductor pollicis longus, you can see it is in a different little compartment of a retinaculum here. It is accompanied by the extensor pollicis brevis muscle. So do not be fooled here. The abductor pollicis longus is not accompanied by the abductor pollicis brevis. The abductor pollicis brevis is in the hand. The abductor pollicis longus is accompanied by the extensor pollicis brevis in a separate retinacular compartment here, as they both travel to the phenar area of the hand. As we continue in the same direction, here is the extensor pollicis longus muscle. Directly next to it, the extensor indices muscle. They both pass under the flexor retinaculum to insert onto phalanges within the hand. They both pass under the extensor retinaculum with the extensor pollicis longus inserting into the base of the distal phalanx of the thumb. Remember that the thumb only has a distal and proximal, no intermediate phalanx. Now, we have discussed all the muscles. There's one more high yield thing that needs to be reviewed, which is the anatomical snuff box. The anatomical snuff box is a deepened triangular area where people actually used to put snuff, which is some sort of inhaled tobacco. Don't know anything about it. Sounds kind of strange, but the boundaries of the space are defined 
by the extensor pollicis brevis muscle, the extensor pollicis longus muscle, the distal part of the radius, and the extensor carpi radialis longus muscle. So don't think about this too hard. Extensor pollicis brevis, the longus, and then include extensor carpi radialis longus. This is a very high yield space because it's also one of the things that most doctors get sued over that deal with musculoskeletal injuries. And that is due to injury to this bone, the scaphoid. So when someone falls on an outstretched hand, for example, a skateboarder falls on the pavement but braces their fall, it can actually be damaged to the scaphoid and its weak arterial supply, leading to avascular necrosis, which is not readily visible on a radiograph immediately. You have to have these patients follow in about two weeks and you put them in a cast temporarily. You have to palpate for tenderness in the anatomical snuff box because it'll help determine your clinical probability of the person who actually suffered a scaphoid fracture. So if you imagine if you press here in the snuff box and they're like, ouch doc, I wish you would stop doing that, you should have a high clinical suspicion for a scaphoid fracture. In addition, the radial artery is also present in this area here at the border of the snuff box where the extensor pollicis brevis runs alongside the abductor pollicis longus. You can see that the abductor pollicis longus dives deep to the opponent's pollicis and the abductor pollicis brevis. So you have the abductor pollicis longus is diving to join its brother or the brevis that's actually found as one of the phenar muscles. Thank you.